Hello everyone, Professor Dustin here, and in this video I'm going to talk about work, energy, and forces. So throughout this semester we've modeled the interaction between multiple objects in two different ways. Uh, one with energy, specifically with potential energy, so an object which is above the surface of the Earth interacts with the Earth through the gravitational potential energy, and also with forces, and in the same way that object interacts with uh, the um, with the Earth through the gravitational force, its mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So these things are connected. We've discovered they are connected through this concept of work. So remember the formula for work looks something like this, f dot delta r. And the interpretation of work is that when there's some force acting on a system, the amount of energy that is transferred to that system or taken away because of that force is the work. So when we act on a system with some force, the work we act on that system with is the change in energy of that system. That's a statement of the work energy theorem. And when I state that work energy theorem, what I'm saying is the total change in energy of the system is equal to the net work done on the system. So this network is the sum of the works from all the forces acting on the system. So we've studied similar physical situations using uh, interactions as energy and using interactions as forces. When we dealt with energy, we had objects rolling down hills, sliding down hills, being dropped, being pushed across surfaces, a variety of different things. We studied those same systems using forces, force, uh, objects sliding down ramps, um, being pushed across surfaces, being dropped, being thrown. So obviously, um, the same physical situation can be represented in multiple different ways using either energy or forces. So this does two different things. One, it allows us to write the same problem in multiple ways and maybe decide which way is the best way to solve that problem. But it also um, adds some complication. Are there some things which can only be represented as forces or some things that can only be represented as energy? So this section of the class is going to be talking about what's the interaction here? Uh, how can some interactions be represented as forces, some as energy, some as both? And how do we use the work energy theorem in that context to solve problems? And so that's what the focus of this day and these videos are going to be about. Okay, so before going into talking about uh, the work energy theorem in more detail, I need to give you a little bit more information about this work formula. Specifically, this is actually not going to be applicable for all the forces that we want to deal with in our classroom. So remember that this, uh, this force is the vector force acting on a system. This delta r is the change in displacement of that system, and this dot product is the dot product between these two vectors. So this is a fine formula as long as the force is constant. So if it's the gravitational force, friction force, a constant pushing force, anything like that. The problem becomes when this force depends on the position. So let's say that somebody throws me a ball and I catch it. What I do is when the ball reaches my hand, I grab it. I have almost no force acting on the ball. And as I recoil and absorb the momentum of the ball, I act more and more on the ball to make sure it doesn't like hit me in the face or something, right? So the amount of force I'm acting on the ball with is changing as I absorb um, the motion of the ball. But which force do I put into this formula to figure out how much work I do on the ball? Is it the force at the beginning when the force is small, or is it the force at the end when the force is large? And the problem is that um, I'm changing the amount of work that I do at every moment on the ball. So I really can't just put, put in one of those uh, forces. I have to incorporate the fact that I do a little bit of work now, a little bit more work now, and a lot of work at the end to make sure I catch it. So the process I'm describing here is well described by calculus, right? I'm integrating the force over the distance to make sure that I absorb more and more of the work until I get to the final amount. So we're going to have to replace this formula with an equivalent formula that's an integral of this one. So that looks something like this. So what I've done is I've replaced the finite difference delta r with the infinitesimal distance dr. And I've added an integral sign to indicate that I'm going to integrate whatever this quantity is. I should also be a little bit more careful. I have to indicate the initial and final points. And we'll just say p1 and p2 as whatever the final and initial points are. So I should point out now that because of this expression, these problems can get quite complicated. So let's say that we have some initial position p1. We have the path of the object, which is this dr. And maybe it's some complicated thing, right? Because if we have some arbitrary object, 
could be moving in some arbitrary way. And what we'd have to do is calculate f dot dr, like at every point. So the dr is maybe right here. If we're pushing with some f right there, maybe down here, the dr is right there. Maybe the f is that way. Some kind of complicated thing. And we have to add up at every point what the f dot dr is. So that could be a really complicated process. Generally, in this class, we won't have to deal with this general problem, which is called a line in the row, which you've probably seen in calculus. Mostly, we're just going to have f and dr, which are acting in either one direction or in straight lines in two dimensions. So we can do this integral pretty easily. But we just need to be aware that when you upgrade the work to this formula, things can get pretty complicated. So let's do a specific example of this. There is a well-known force, which is dependent on position, and that is the spring force. So if I have a spring, and I'm going to make a spring which is being compressed by some kind of block. So here's a compressed spring. And I've pushed this block onto the spring in such a way that it has compressed a distance x. And I'm also going to say distance x. I'm also going to say that the origin of my coordinate system is right here. And my positive x coordinate is this way. So I'm also assigning a coordinate system right there where this is y, this is x. And the amount that, the, uh, that this block is compressed is delta x. So the spring force in this situation is minus k times x. So we haven't talked much about the spring force, but you know about the potential energy due to a spring. So you shouldn't be surprised that you see this spring constant in there. That's the same spring constant as from the potential energy due to a spring. This x tells you how much the spring is compressed. In this case, because this is 0, the, uh, the block is compressing the spring to the left. That's to the negative x direction. So that x will be negative. That will make this entire thing positive. Fs will be positive, And that's what makes sense. Because that spring force is going to be in that direction. It's going to be wanting to push the block to the right in the positive x direction, which you get correctly when your displacement of this thing is negative. OK, so that's the spring force. This is only in one dimension. The spring is just making the block propel along the x direction in the positive direction. So let's formulate the question this way. Let's say that as the block goes from the initial x position, let's call that x1, to some final x position, x2, how much work does that spring do on the block? So if I want to calculate the amount of work that the spring does as it um, Takes the, takes the block from x1 to x2. I'm obviously going to have to do this integral, which means I'm going to have to do this dot product. So I think the way that I want to do that is I want to write the spring force as a vector. So the spring force as a vector has 0 in the y direction. So there's no vector component in the y direction. But there is a vector component in the x direction, and it's minus kx. That's in the x direction x half. So this tells me that the same thing it tells me here when x is negative, this entire thing is positive, fs is in the positive x half direction. Very good. Now I need to write dr as a vector. Well, the nice thing about dr is dr is just a generic infinitesimal element. So I can write dx as the infinitesimal in the x direction x hat plus dy, infinitesimal in the y direction y hat. Very good. No problem. So now I need to calculate what fs dot dr is. So remember the definition of the dot product. Take the product of the x's and add the product of the y's. In this case, there's no fs in the y direction, so that term goes away. And we just get the product of uh, the x direction, the spring force, and the x direction of dr. That's minus kx dx. So this dot product is simply minus kx dx. Cool. So let's plug that into the work formula. That's going to be minus kx times dx. I need to indicate the initial and final positions. Well, because I wrote it this way, my initial and final positions really should be a two-dimensional problem. But my object is only moving in one dimension. So I can just write from x1 to x2. Very good. Now I want to do this integral. I think first what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this minus k because it's constant. So that's minus k integral from x1 to x2 of x dx. So now we need to go back to your calculus knowledge. 
how do you integrate x dx? Well, remember the integration rule. Uh, x goes up one power to x squared, and then you have to put a one half in, in front to account for the fact that when you take that derivative, one half goes away, and we get minus k x squared over two, integrated between x one and x two. And when you put in the limits, you put in x two first, then put in x one, and our final answer becomes minus one half k x two squared minus x one squared. So I put in one limit and subtract off the other limits. OK, and that's the amount of work that that spring does as it pushes it. Um, so this was just an example calculation to show you that um, how you actually apply this work formula. What we would do next, next is use this in the work energy theorem to see like how fast this block was moving when it came off of the spring. But this is a simple ac application of this more advanced form of the work formula where you have to take the integral of f dot dr. OK, great. So I hope this video has been helpful in illustrating what the new work formula is and how to apply it in at least one situation. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.